Hola, welcome. Welcome to the Balance and Balance Chair in Art and Climate, Cátedra Balance and Balance en Arte y Clima. Esta es la sesión número 8, hoy es eh, mayo 20 del 2022. Mi nombre es Ricardo Dalfarra y hoy tenemos una sesión, como siempre, excelente, con tres invitadas muy importantes, Daniel Simbiera, Olga Mink, Raza Smite. Pero antes de, de la presentación de cada una de ellas, le quiero dar la palabra al decano de la Universidad Jorge Tadeo Lozano, Felipe César Londoño. So I'm going to, after, after this introduction that I was doing in Spanish, uh, in this uh, session number eight of the Balance and Balance Chair in Art and Climate, uh, we are going to have three special guests, Olga Ming, Daniel Simbiera, and Rasa Smite. But first, we are going to listen to Felipe Londoño, Dean of um, Art and Design, at the Jorge Tadeo Lozano University in Bogotá. Felipe. Gracias, Ricardo. Uh, hello, Daniel, Olga, and Raza. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, in this uh, last session uh, of uh, the Balance and Balance Share in Art and Climate, I, I would like to give a special thanks to Ricardo Dalfarra for the general coordination to, uh, to Maloca, uh, to Concordia University and to all the organizations uh, that made it possible. Uh, precisely uh, inspired by, the, by this initiative, uh, the SHAIL, uh, I would also like to announce the opening of the new doctorate in design, art and science that uh, was recently approve, uh, approved uh, by the Ministry of National Education in line with the postulate of the that uh, Roger Malina, Ricardo Dalfarra, the Leonardo Journal, and many others have been stating for many years, the PhD program will depend of, of the inter, interdisciplinary relation, relation between art and science to contribute to solve the complex problem of the world. The PhD is carried out in alliance with Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and uh, Chile, uh, uh, with the participation of Tania Edo, Daniel Cruz, Martin Groisman, Cleo Marrocha, Ricardo Dalfarra, and many other persons and organizations. Uh, finally, I would like to invite you uh, to the International Image Festival that will take place in October 2022 uh, in Bogotá y Manizales, uh, with the support of the University of Caldas and Jorge Tadeo Lozano University. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you again, Daniel, Raza, Olga, for yeah. your participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felipe. And thank you also for helping to put all these projects and dreams together. We have been collaborating for many, many years in so many projects. So this chair in Balance and Balance Chair in Art and Climate is another result of uh, collaborative process, processes for many, many years. So uh, to introduce a little bit the topic of today, uh, basically always in the Balance and Balance Chair in Art and Climate, as the title name says, we are focusing on climate change, environmental crisis, but this connected to many, many different aspects of life. And the idea is always trying to not just to talk, but trying to find solutions as far as possible. So I think that we are bringing here three people that have been working in interesting projects. In particular, the topic of today has to do with networks. So uh, let me read a couple of sentences about that, and then I will introduce our first guest. Solving the climate crisis is not a problem of science and technology, at least not exclusively. It is above all a cultural problem. Knowledge networks, contacts, diversity in ways of thinking and understanding the world and life on our planet are essential to survive this moment of extreme fragility. Also, it is crucial to build agreements that could lead us to coexistence where we will have the opportunity and the possibility of continuing to grow and improve as a civilization. So that's the, the basic introduction. Um, 
And we are going to have our three guests, Olga Mink, Rasa Smite, and Daniel Simbiera, uh, presenting for 15, 20 minutes each. And then we will have time for questions. And I hope you can post questions between yourself. I mean, you don't, we don't need to wait only for questions from other people that are welcome, of course. Uh, so, but we can also, and I expect you can ask between you and critiques if you have. I mean, just feel free to, to exchange between you in the last part of the session. So let me start by introducing uh, our first guest of today, Rasa Smite. She's an artist, network researcher, and cultural innovator working with science and emerging technology since the 90s. She's founding director of RICS, the Center of New Media Culture in Riga, in Latvia. She's curator of its annual festivals and a chief editor of Acoustic Space, a peer review publication series. Rasa holds a PhD in sociology of culture and media from Riga Stradins University in 2011, and a master in visual arts from the Arts Academy of Latvia in 2000. She currently works as an associate professor in new media art program at the Liepaja University. In her artistic practice since the mid 90s, Rasa Smite works together with Raipi Smith, creating, creating networked visionary and innovative artworks. Their pioneering internet art project, ExchangeNet.radio Network, was awarded with the Prix Arts Electronica in 1998. The, each of you has a very long CV, so I'm very doing an extract of that. But let me finish with Rasa saying that she's lecturing extensively on creative network and sustainability, ecology, and contemporary media art, contemporaneity and network post media art and other topics. And uh, out of reading your your part part of your bio, I always admired the work you were doing with uh, writers. Uh, especially regarding networks and ecology linked to networks. So I think you were doing a great work and I would love to hear about that. Welcome, Rasa. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me. I'm really happy to participate in this art and climate discussion, especially about uh, if we talk today about the networks. So I will now share the screen. Go full screen. Okay, so as uh, my title shows today, I would like to talk about networks as a sensory systems. Uh, because uh, uh, by just uh, a default definition of the networks. Network is a set of interconnected nodes. Uh, so which means that uh, anything can be the network, just uh, depending on the nodes, uh, we can identify this particular network, what it is. Um, but if we would like to talk in the context of art and climate, I think uh, then it starts to make, th make sense also to think about and not to forget about um, also other non-human actors, which also could become a part of this network, which we should then uh, investigate. Uh, so, yeah, uh, of course, uh, in the in the mid nineties, um, this uh, general network definition seemed actually quite revolutionary for me, especially coming from the very close society. Uh, like from the after after the walls of the uh, Soviet Union were broke down, and we appeared in a free and independent Latvia, which suddenly also also happened at the same time with advent of the internet. So and for us, uh, it seemed that we were among those artists who were searching for these connections. So we were really working uh, in a very pioneering stage uh, a lot with. Uh, uh, with internet and particularly also with the sound. 
and sound. Why sound? Because it's a, one of those sensory medias which kind of goes beyond the visual, which has different properties than visual culture has. So for us, uh, sound uh, in combination with these networks made um, these experiences particularly alive. Yeah, so it was a little bit similar like with the other inventions of video when suddenly these uh, little energy impulses were, became available uh, and also later with the telephony. Uh, so also in quite early stage, we did different artistic experiments with also remote sensing and or cosmic energies, uh, trying to pick up the signals from the, from the uh, space, but also trying to create new constellations to say new networks because we were bringing together artists and scientists and also we were like um, investigating so uh, a specific conditions for example like this former military site in the uh, western part of latvia where this even a radio telescope uh, was located uh, so that so so there were different uh, other uh, different uh, aspects which were kind of uh, overlapping and fusing. So first of all, artists could enter, which uh, formerly was military and top secret. And secondly, so it was also the time in 2001 before the scientists arrived. However, at the moment, this uh, site uh, is uh, still um, welcoming artists as well. It's, it's working now as um, a fully operating uh, uh, scientific site, 20% uh, but also, of course, from they receive some funding from Defense Ministry, I'm sure, so I'm sure so that also it has some uh, specific missions as well. But we are, with Rixi, we have start, launched also a new uh, residency program in, with this urban radio telescope. So that's one of these uh, possibilities, so, uh, which, uh, which we are trying also to explore as a network. Uh, so in the, about like 2006 and seven, we were very much interested right after the internet, we were thinking what, if, what happens if we are working with this internet technology? So what about the climate? What about the ecology? So uh, how does it affect? Because we need this energy. We need also all these uh, devices and, and, and what's happening also with our electromagnetic spectrum. So this was one of the very early also ecological projects which we did in 2000 which was a meta research about uh, another uh, military site in, in Latvia, which were, which were these um, uh, radar sites, which were all around the Soviet Union or Russian border. And also a similar radar system is all around the United States border as well. So they were kind of counter um, uh, about, yeah, probably no nuclear missiles, the most uh, maybe were in attack. So it's kind of, uh, kind of uh, after these uh, many years again could become uh, relevant. Uh, so the other thing that we have been doing with the technologies is we have been also trying to humanize them somehow to add the human di uh, dimension as well. And so the GPS, which is soon after, like very quickly after 2001 become available also for, for just the civilian use before it was very unprecise. But uh, so we organized one of the first also locate your media workshops in in um, in, uh, in Latvia. But we but uh, also Rixi uh, team uh, with Eva Auzinja and uh, uh, Dutch artist uh, Esther Pollock. So they went to specifically to eastern part also where still and they were uh, tracking uh, with these GPS devices like daily routes of the. Uh, farming culture, what is happening, and how all these uh, milks collected in Latvia, so how they are uh, transformed, transformed, produced into the cheese and sent into Utrecht and Amsterdam's markets. So, um, so this was kind of um, our our combination uh, of um, trying to combine, uh, of trying to. Uh, from one side, really go into much more inviting to go into much more deeper understanding of technology because it's obviously it's definitely is a, an extension of our desires because we would like to communicate, we would like to overcome big distances. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we also are very interested in uh, in all those uh, different aspects of uh, of ecology. So how these could come together. So how we could build so-called techno-ecological networks. So that uh, we don't have 
uh, escape of the technologies or say they, they don't need them anymore but to save the nature but are there any possibility that we can do this uh, these both sides can come together uh, so just like as like as an example uh, is a, for example our project human plant communication it was a simple interface where we created uh, over the internet inviting people to talk to plants which we were growing in some exhibition spaces and it was for uh, it's 2011 these days quite many people actually really many working with the plants but that time we were not even sure if these plants will grow so for us it was quite a, an experiment and a successful one so we were growing in different uh, locations and also these messages were read loudly by the loudspeaker to these plants growing it was, a, uh, it was not a very serious project, uh, uh, like um, uh, scientifically. It was not really an art and science project, but also because, as also Ricardo mentioned, my background is sociology. So we were also interested in more actually in the social part. So how people actually encounter the plants, how people do they talk to them? And by big surprise, they really talked and a lot. So about like 20,000 messages we were collecting over like a couple of months of period in five exhibitions. So which we later analyzed and also made these clouds. Uh, very interestingly, like uh, concluding that um, when we approach plants, we kind of first don't say I like in a Facebook, but you. Yeah, so that's kind of a second, a sec another approach. Uh, but if you talk about these sensitive uh, sensory systems uh, and network systems, so then I would like also to refer to Bruno Latour, who is asking, but how do we make ourselves actually sensitive? And uh, what is happening if we imagining that we are connected everywhere and everything with, with what we hear, feel or smell? Or if we think that just also 90% of our own body also is constituted from those which are not human um, and so this was also another our participation in a critical zones project curated by P Peter Weibel and Bruno Latour so because the scientists are suggesting that actually this tiny tiny layer around the, our planet uh, is could be called critical zones and this is uh, because it's a it's a very tiny layer where all the life uh, on the planet uh, is actually happening and which is maintained. Uh, so just to mention another project uh, is um, where we were also interested in this ecological systems and also how we people who we need energy, how we can also maybe benefit from them and not sure how big is this intervention. So this, uh, but we were um, installing in the pond uh, the microbial fuel cells, uh, which are uh, which are uh, receiving small electric currents produced by bacteria who live in the sediments of the pond, for example. And so we, what we did, we also like made the, made uh, this uh, complexity uh, audible through some sonifications, mainly through different patterns. Uh, altogether, it was an uh, experiment for seven months when we installed these six pound batteries in outdoors of Riga Botanical Garden. And it was late uh, winter when we took them down because just all the numbers of this electricity production went down, mainly not because bacteria were not living anymore, but because uh, our technical installation was not so strong uh, to survive all these uh, freezing and melting stages. and. I will show just like one minute um, in this video. Yes. Thank you. 
you know, as you see, the numbers are are dropping down, but uh, but uh, this electricity was uh, fluctuating up and down, also showing that in a natural environment, uh, this electricity production could be even maybe much more different than we imagine it, like in, through the chemical processes. Uh, and uh, and um, just to uh, just to conclude with the also my, our last uh, artwork, uh, and also because we because what what we usually do we are in, we are not only creating our own artworks we usually around the same topic around the same time are also often organizing symposiums festivals curating exhibitions because we would like to always also hear much more feedback and understanding also from the uh, other uh, community or a network of people who are working with similar topics and uh, and uh, at the moment so uh, which is really directly connected to the climate is our atmospheric forest uh, this is the artwork which um, which is visualizing the relations between the uh, terrestrial ecosystems and the atmosphere yeah, because we have previously worked with the signals so I was very much interested in searching for this missing link what exactly connects our tiny layer around the planet yeah, covered with the forest for example with all these other um, natural natural environments and with this atmosphere which always seems like kind of sky above is very very far and uh, not so much connected but what we learned that actually this is all very much connected and that's very, very close because the trees are living organisms and they are breathing and their emissions reach far out into the atmosphere, into the lo lower levels and they create clouds and they also are responsible for the weather conditions locally as well as probably also uh, affect somehow global warming even on a larger scale. And uh, also that this specifically, this network, or how I call it, ecosystematic way in a research yeah, perspective, it has been uh, quite recently also introduced by climate and forest scientists. So they only recently start to look uh, at the ecosystems also like with Bruno Latour's project of, of, of critical zones. Uh, scientists are now trying to put much more efforts instead of understand one way of like one species. So they try to uh, research hold the ecosystem in a particular maybe area like this one in Pinwald, where which is a, a Swiss Alpine forest suffering from drought and where scientists were doing different measurements and, and providing different also irrigation experiments. Um, yeah, so just to finish uh, is that um, yeah how how we can think about all these human and more than human connections and uh, how we can uh, make these our networks more more open because the networks usually have really weak ties that's a big problem with the networks especially contemporary networks which in our societies because maybe family based like a more traditional networks they had much stronger ties but in contemporary society often these ties can just be there you know about two or three thousand of people but they never uh, but but there may be happening things then these ties never become really active and so even much more difficult if we want to talk about this more than human networks uh, so and that's why uh, one of the uh, my proposals would be about how and what are kind of the tools could help, or technologies could help us to become more sensible so that we can perceive these environments and maybe find together better ways how to live on this planet better together. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasa. Let me bring back the video. So many interesting things. I hope we can come back on some of these uh, aspects uh, after Daniel and Olga's presentation. I was just just something brief that you were mentioning several times, Bruno Latour, and maybe we can talk a little bit after about what he, as, as well as many other people were mentioning, that many times we are discussing about, you know, human survival, but I think the problem, as he was saying, I mean, it's not just survival of the species, but it's like the civilization that's 
another it's a different thing i mean if the people as a human species will survive is one aspect but then um, if civilization as we know it uh, it can survive that's a really different aspect so um let me introduce now daniel simbiera also thank you so much daniel for accepting the invitation daniel is the senior arts manager of the city of san jose office of economic development and cultural affairs she's the former chief creative officer of the enterprise think tank leonardo international society of arts science and technology daniel's mission is to empower communities by navigating complex systems that affect us all of us uh, focusing especially on clean energy and responsible consumption and production through creative entrepreneurship and economy in addition to her cultural works daniel simbiera is a systems artist practicing at the intersection of community emerging technology and environment daniel holds a, a master of fine arts in digital media arts from san jose state university probably you you pronounce san jose very differently than me but san jose in spanish sounds like san jose sorry <laughs> okay daniel's social impact company art inspector saving the earth by changing art uh, is founded in art and has received funding funding sorry from silicon valley energy watch and working with the city of san sorry san francisco department of environment to help artists work uh, healthier and safer Daniel is also a member of the Ocean Memory Project, a collective of artists and scientists looking at what happens below water. Her work has been presented globally, including the 01 SJ Biennale, Biennale in the heart of the Silicon Valley, also in the National Gallery in Copenhagen and the Education Center of the National Hermitage in St. Petersburg in Russia. Welcome. Uh, Daniel, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Ricardo, and everyone for hosting this event. I uh, feel great coming in after Rasa because a lot of what I'm going to be discussing is that connection between uh, interspecies communication and the human and non-human network. And I wanted to start first by addressing everyone who is who is viewing this live or at our recording. As you're connecting back. To, to what I'm presenting and what Balance um, and the other speakers in this series. Uh, I acknowledge that you are now part of my network and of each other's networks. Uh, networks are completely layered, they're based in communities, and that has a lot of different meetings and context depending on where you are in the world. And by engaging today, by just even passively listening to, to what I'm sharing and, and thinking about this and down the line, this will help layer into the networks that you are all connected to. Uh, we all are connected to networks that are localized, that are international, that are, that are even invisible uh, on a daily basis. And I want to recognize that as we are connecting together today, we are also connecting together on multiple levels of uh, of networks uh, and that they there there's this is not a uh, single plane environment. This is really uh, deep and layered, and it has its own past, and it has its own presence, and it has its own future. So so recognize that as we're coming in together today, and we're and we're we're really thinking about how uh, we can connect both with the, amongst each other as 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 humans, but also uh, with our um, interspecies networks. And then also thinking about the past, where we've coming, where we're coming from, and I want to just acknowledge, speaking of the past, where I am coming from. So um, right now I am in the what the contemporary name of Oakland, California, uh, which was which is situated on the Huichan Ohlone land, Huichan Ohlone territory. Uh, this land acknowledgement to understand that I'm coming to you from occupied space uh, and from um, a, a network that still exists uh, in this region of California. Uh, and I want to recognize the land that was built and stewarded by the Ohlone people 
and the past that they've built and then the future that we're, we're building together. Um, but also recognizing that, that we are sitting on uh, occupied space. And this is important to think about where we are, our, our past networks, where we're, the land that we're sitting on and those who have, have, have given us that opportunity to be able to communicate virtually or with each other in person, that this, this land acknowledgement is, is, is something that we want to thank and recognize and realize that this is um, developed over thousands and thousands of years with, with people who have really um, cultivated the land and created this, the, the atmosphere, the environment, and that things have changed over time. So I just wanted to, to, to put that out there and recognize it. I wanna start with um, thinking about this last few years, but even prior to that, uh, we, we're in a state of our world where things are literally on fire. In California, we've had several years of fires. We've lost entire cities and villages to fires and mudslides. And this is, this is actually a result of uh, climate change. This is a result of um, uh, the, the overdevelopment of us as people in, in occupying space and taking over land, uh, taking over land that, that belongs to other species, other animals. Uh, and this also is not unique to California. We've seen fires all over the world, in Australia, in other regions. But on top of that, there's also been hurricanes, uh, tsunamis, other disaster mitigate, massive disasters uh, in Fukushima. Uh, that is really a disaster that was created by man that reached the entire world. What I, what I want to emphasize here in looking at uh, the, the, the issue of our, our climate crisis, the pandemic, um, issues around racial uprising and politics, all of that combined is, is not limited to a single border or single region or a single species. That, that actually reaches every single being uh, on the planet, uh, from microorganisms all the way uh, to, to, to humans and other animals, uh, networks of trees, and it is destroying our planet. And we're here today because we actually care about our planet. The, 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 the Balance and Balance Conference that has been going on for several years has been working towards getting networks of people who come from the science community, who come from policy making, who come from arts, uh, who come from literature, who come from uh, different areas of technology to sort of look at some of the issues that are, we're, we're really facing front on today in this moment. And I wanna recognize that, that everybody is not immune to this and we're all involved in it and our lives are all affected by it in one way or another. This is, this is part of the complexity, part of the layering that we're having to deal with. And you know, I'm, I'm bringing this from the perspective of where I live in California, but I also want you to think about where you live and how, how things are affecting where you are. Um, how has, has the climate crisis impacted your life? Um, and then that could be in multiple ways. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're experiencing it directly um, on hand. Maybe you are, maybe you're part of a, an, an area that has a drought, uh, earthquakes, fires, but you also could be uh, uh, understanding it financially, emotionally, psychologically. Uh, we have a, a whole, our whole selves, our whole communities and networks that are being affected by the, 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 the different crises that are going around globally. So this, this is really something that I've been thinking through quite a bit, and especially during the pandemic when we had to, on a, as on a global level, figure out how our networks can connect together to address a, a deadly virus that was spreading all over the world. So it wasn't really done in a way that was in a vacuum where there was one network or, or organization trying to address um, this, this virus, it was sharing information and connecting to each other in, um, in digital cloud systems, using uh, artificial intelligence to be able to analyze and read data, to map um, geno uh, genomes, to map different types of viruses, um, so that, that, that we are able to view these types of situations computationally uh, and creatively. And we were able to, to, to work towards solutions um, such as understanding how vaccines may prevent or attribute to that, 
but also just sort of being able to share information and that understanding of sharing of information, sharing of that network uh, and that knowledge, that knowledge sharing became so critical over the last couple of years, but this is not the only time that we're gonna be addressing this. So I want to, 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 to really see this and, and understanding that the, um, the, the, ne necess the necessity, of no necessity of knowledge sharing is, is going to be important ongoing. It has been in the past, but how do we actually broaden that up and how do we actually look at big data, a lot of information, and actually how do we then start to be able to bring in the ideas, the importance and the communities um, that are affected by this? Because at the moment, a lot of this is really done in a, 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 a high level of knowledge um, capability process. So you have to be able to understand a certain level of science or be able to connect into this uh, scientific network or, or, or academic network to be able to understand this information. But there are other parts and other contexts that, that we can start to look at to be able to build together different sorts solutions to address our climate crises and, and, and other endemics and pandemics and syndemics. And I wanna start with some of the common ways that, that humans uh, talk. Right, so how, how we share information. Uh, so I want you to think back to around March of 2020 when the, 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 the global pandemic first started and how you were connecting with people and how you were sharing that information. There are hundreds of different ways to share information with, between humans. And, and a lot of that has really been pushed onto a digital space. So you have social networks. Uh, so if you are looking at this right now on YouTube, YouTube is a social network that's giving information out. You can add information to the chat. Uh, where you know, WhatsApp is, is you, you connect with your friends and family in these group chats, share information about how you feel uh, on, in a very casual voice, but also sharing knowledge, um, connecting in uh, situational and, and environmental situations that are happening locally with each other. Uh, there are Zoom chats and Zoom calls all over the world, as an example. And there's things that are offline, right? There's just being able to go outside and meet with your community, meet with your neighbors. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, uh, I have uh, organized a block party with my with my neighborhood, and we've met every single Sunday since March of 2020, uh, so that we can have that off per, uh, offline in person um, connection. So. All of this information that is happening between these social networks and languages all over the world. So this is also done in in every in every language, and it is done in just hundreds of different platforms. It's not really um, situated with with only one single source of connecting. What happens to those conversations? What happens to um, the casual conversations on WhatsApp? Uh, what happens in in uh, Facebook groups where people are sharing information? and connecting to each other, learning how to collaborate. Um, what happens in uh, the offline groups where you're having dinner with friends and family and you're, and you're sharing information, but then that information is coming from different types of media. This is something that I've been really um, looking at and investigating. How do we actually sort of collect these ephemeral and casual conversations? How do we understand them? How do we, how do we look at that as, as um, important data to connect and to join in with ourselves. And like, how do we actually look at that to start to build a grassroots movement and how to build solutions? Uh, because I personally am, are, am part of dozens of different groups and our conversations seem similar across a lot of these groups, especially when it comes to looking at the response of, of the pandemic and the response of, of, of trauma and crisis uh, and how we want to you know, support each other and how we want to connect with each other. And last year, I, I, when I was with Leonardo, I worked with a, with a really incredible team. And I want to, I want to recognize um, um, them, um, Stephen uh, Orschwitz, uh, Laura um, Schwartz, and Gustavo Rincon, who, who together uh, really looked at how do you actually um, look at the multidimensionality of these conversations and connect those together and be able to sort of pull out important and collaborative ideas and processes. And so thinking about still, how do we actually understand this on a, on a scale, on a large level? I also wanna recognize that while at the same time, 
we we have these human conversations, which right now we're capturing very well digitally. There's there's millions and millions of probably billions of pieces of data out there that can be brought in to understand and analyze. Um, you know, uh, Rasa brought up a, a lot of different examples of how we're actually trying to listen to and understand and connect with with, with non-human species. So creating that interspecies communication discussion. You know, mycelial networks are a great example of that. So, so we are, have this capability now of using sensors to listen um, to um, uh, vibrations and sonify um, uh, mycelial uh, beings who are, have their own particular network and particular space. Also forests, you know, listening to trees, you know, listening to bacteria. We have, we're able to do this on a, a microbial level. Uh, we have ways to listen to uh, dolphins and other sea creatures and sea animals. So we're sci humans are collecting scientifically and artistically all of this uh, non-human data. And so how do we actually then connect the non-human data to the human data? And, the, and how do we then look at what communities of, um, of, of mycelial networks, how, what are they communicating about? What are, what are, um, you know, schools of fish talking about, or, in, or and maybe it's not talking. It's what are the, what's their what's their conversation? How do we contextualize that? How do we look at that not just in an anthropomorphical way, but also be able to sort of understand how they actually share information? And then how do we connect that back to what localized communities are are sharing within their networks? And so this this trying to understand this human to non human uh, conversations, trying to find those common threads. Uh, so that we can then create a better rapid response model to to the climate crisis uh, is what some, is what I've been looking towards trying to understand a little bit more. And there are different models of how to do that. So there's there's uh, looking at uh, machine learning and deep learning and deep hyperspace, looking at this in a in a multidimensional way um, can allow us to be able to create and contextualize patterns of similarities. Uh, on the on the um, the non-human communication side and on the human communication side, and then try to find those common threads to start to be able to understand how do you actually pose new questions that we aren't even asking necessarily, but also starting to find um, those threads of context that are similar. And I think the the difference that I th that I think this artificial intelligence can help us make is looking at these billions of pieces of data and being able to start to understand context. Uh, and look at that context to propose uh, um, more, more and deeper ways of inclusion and diversity in the solutions that we have to the climate crisis. Because right now, a lot of the solutions we have with climate climate crisis, uh, from a, 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 a high level down, from the big tech or major government policy down, are really done by a selective group of people. There are very few people who are involved in that. There's not so much about the pulling that information from the groundswell up into making those decisions around policy, around the economy, uh, around uh, different sort of technologies and actions or solutions. Uh, this, this being able to connect with this humans and non-humans and predict, um, predict that um, what, what we can do for the future or see, see crisis, crises coming towards us through this model is something that I'm really interested in. It, so I, I've been calling this um, predictive conversations, um, looking at uh, basically looking at this as a future casting tool to be able to see uh, how you actually connect these, these uh, uh, how you pull in that data from networks from around the world in multiple languages and um, with the multiple species. And then how do you analyze that and then predict solutions or questions or ideas for the future? And what I see happening with this is, is really artists are going to be at the center of it. So artists are going to be the ones who then are going to take um, a lot of this data and this information and be able to look at creating interfaces, performances, experiences, visualizations um, that, that the, the rest of the public can be able to engage with and connect into. So that's one of the, 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 the network um, research areas that I'm beginning to, to evolve and research in. Um, I want to also uh, talk, and in, in, in the last five minutes of, of this, about a project that I uh, that I worked on last this last year um, with uh, the artist Jeff Hawkins, who um, helped uh, Leonardo look at their network. So Leonardo, if you're not familiar with them, is a is a um, enterprise think tank that's been around for over 50 years and 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 really looks at impact 
at its center? And then how do we actually look at all these structures and ways that we can address that impact? But it's really bringing in a lot of people from around the world that are that are that think interdisciplinary uh, in an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary way, uh, but also are really not afraid of complexity. So, so I want to share an example of um, how we looked at visualizing that network because I think visualizing the networks. It, it, it can be pretty challenging. So um, I'm gonna, um, just give me one second here. I'm gonna share the screen. Okay. Uh, and I wanna show you what, what Jeff had designed. And I think this is kind of an interesting um, model and actually just realized that I did not stop sharing really quick so we could change the audio. Okay, sure, sound great. So one of the questions that, that we had proposed was how do we actually look at um, all the different types of disciplines that people are crossing into and how do we actually sort of understand how that cross works? And so Jeff put together this, this uh, visualization that sort of in, in part um, a score and in part um, an abacus. And you can go through this and start to, to, to look at how people are combined. And this has thousands of different profiles and people in there. But if you wanted to look at like somebody who was interested in design, but then also was interested in, in net art, how would you identify those people? And as this goes through, you would, you'll, you would be able to see lines of where those connected with. So if it was somebody who um, was involved in both net art and design, um, you could see this happen. And then you also could, um, choose a person and, and look through their profile and you'll notice that their bio would come up here and then you can get um some more information about that and it's they who they are um and where they're and where that crossover is and so you know if you are somebody who is um listening and, and participating in in this um call right now chances are you are part of the, this this broad network this interdisciplinary network but you know, the, I think it's a, it's a it's a helpful tool and idea to sort of think about how do we all collaborate and connect and together. So um, this this vision is something that Jeff um, and and our team had been working on for about a year, looking at the different possibilities and understanding is how do you actually visualize and understand the networking. There's about ninety different. Um, uh, areas uh, specialized in here. And when we were looking at these different areas, I mean, we really came up with about 150 um, different uh, ways that, that our community worked uh, transdiscipl and in a transdisciplinary way, um, but, but was, we're able to sort of pare that down a little bit. There's, you know, the, those who are working on ecology and the environment. So you'll be able to uh, play around with this and, it's, and you can go to Leonardo info slash Leo Spear to get a sense of how this works. Um, but I'm going to pause this right here because um, I think I'm, I'm at time. And um, you know, as we, as we continue to, to explore and think about our networks are uh, thinking about how do we actually tie all the work that we're doing together um, in, in, in an interspecies format in an interspecies way. So um, thank you again to all the organizers today and, uh, and to the other panelists. Thank you so much, Daniel. So very, very interesting. A lot of information, a lot of ideas too. Um, and, and basically, yes, as you said before, Balance and Balance is about um, networks and connecting people from very, very different backgrounds, knowledge. I mean, the common space is the interest in trying to find solutions uh, in different ways. Maybe it's sometimes to local problems, sometimes to regional, sometimes to global issues. But I mean, there are many ways. Uh, uh, same as Leonardo, we were looking through the years, for example, and discussing also with Leonardo sometimes about visualization of this information. I mean, how we connect the people, because that's part it's not the solution, but that could be part of the solution. Um, this this idea of uh, building knowledge networks, I think, is really important. Uh, also, you, you named uh, briefly something about when you said about uh, the 
the different conversations, the different profiles of the people talking, and uh, different, yes, we have a lot of little pieces of information, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, but I mean, a lot of pieces of information. From the very beginning, one of the ideas of uh, Balance and Balance was, yes, we have a lot of information, it's, it's like distributed all, all over the world, but part of the idea and talking with people, not only artists, but people also coming from other areas, uh, the discussion was about that the information was never enough. I mean, we have a lot of information, but this was not enough and we needed to connect people. Uh, so the feelings, the culture, and the, what we could call in English embodiment. Yes, it's like that information needs to come to the people and touch in some way each of us to, to produce some change. But let's go to a, probably a different approach from Olga now. So let me introduce our uh, final presenter of today, uh, Olga Mink from the Netherlands. She obtained her Master of Fine Arts at Sandberg Institute. Olga is currently affiliated as a researcher at Avans University of Applied as a curator and director for the Baltan Laboratories and the Foundation Future of Work. Olga is interested uh, in how art shapes tangible realities in times of profound global challenges. Her ambition to bridge interdisciplinary art with pressing societal challenges resulted in numerous artistic research trajectories involving artists, designers, scientists, public and private institutions, NGOs, and educational partners. As the director of Baltan Lab, she initiated Age of Wonderland, a four-year program to boost social innovation between the global north and south, and also economia. I don't know how you pronounce it there, but in, in, in the south, we call it like economia or economia. In fact, it's in Spanish, okay? So economia festival about economy without the con on stage. I think that's uh, very important. Uh, so that's uh, another aspect that also we addressed this in a balance and balance conference a few years ago in the Netherlands. Uh, Olga uh, co-edited the book Economia Methods for Reclaiming Economy, published by Baltan Lab, and Co-Emerging Economies, Radical Perspective on Post-Anthropocentric Economics. This was together with Rion Brand and was published by Lecturis. So welcome, thank you so much, Olga, for joining us today and talk about the economy probably. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Ricardo, for inviting me. It's great to be here and it seems already two great uh, talks. So I hope I can contribute uh, a little bit to that. Um, so yes, indeed, I'm going to talk about the co-emerging economies and going to share my screen. Um, here it is. And I hope you can all see it right now. So um, um, let me adjust my screen. Um, so yeah, I was already introduced. I work as a curator. Um, initially, I was um, um, uh, educated as an artist and now working as a curator and a director of, of uh, two organizations. And so I wanted to start um, uh, uh, this talk with this quote before I go into the topic of networks and uh, the book that um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to present here. Um, so this, uh, this quote, in an age where the greatest emergency is the absence of emergency, only contemporary art capacity to alter reality can save us. So I was, I was um, uh, struck by this quote and um, uh, because I think as an, I'm an art producer, I work at art, so of course I really like this quote, but what kind of uh, struck me most is this idea of that, the, the absence of emergency. And um, so, and it made me question, is it more urgent than, than um, the aspect of climate change itself? Uh, and it's also like it's that there is this contradictionary between um, the, the, this kind of sense of urgency and, and still being um, always in the now. Um, so uh, it made me wonder, does our relationships with time create a certain inertia 
And why do we not feel the sense of, we do feel it, but we are not acting upon it. And can, uh, can art help us to imagine and see and feel or understand certain concepts which we otherwise cannot, ex which we can art otherwise cannot explain in words. Um, so that's actually something that that I I I I'd like to I I like to believe. However, there's also others that say that, um, for example, uh, exhibitions about art and climate are are like a smokescreen, and they create this ethical dissonance, and um, as, uh, like it's kind of like we are um, part we are not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. And this is, of course, a very cynical viewpoint, which I, I also can relate to in a way, but I do myself really believe that art can help create new ideas and perspectives. And that's also why I work in, in this field. And, uh, and I think art can reach beyond its own borders and it should reach beyond, beyond its own borders. And there, uh, um, which I think there is, the, is, the, is maybe the... The, the challenge that, that we have to how can we um, 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 reach the not converted, let's say, and as such, um, um, uh, take this responsibility of the problem. So, um, uh, so as also in this quote, um, uh, that art can alter our reality in, in, in meaningful ways. Um, and this meaning is always contextual and it's bound to change over time. Um, so this is also uh, why I wanted to uh, show the next slide, if I can, yes, I can do it like this, because I think it's an interesting uh, artwork that um, shows us how meaning in time changes. Um, so this is an artwork um, by Matthew Brudner, and uh, it's, it's about the beauty of the Arctic. Uh, however, it evolved over time into a more frightening representation of the loss of the Arctic environment. And so the passing of cha time changed the meaning of this music. And so I was wondering, like, maybe hopefully in the future, this meaning will change again. And it, be it will become like a, an ancient relic of time. Also, this work um, I wanted to uh, uh, share. So uh, it's it's uh, the a performance, the slowest musical performance by John Cage in Germany, uh, which began in 2001 and it ends in 2000, uh, 2640. And it consists of an organ which plays a piece of music over the course of about 640 years and kind of uh, um, invites us to uh, uh, listen to something that, um, 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 future generations will uh, be, be even that maybe to listen to. And uh, it's, it's, it kind of represents our relationship with unborn strangers, let's say our, our future ancestors maybe. And at the same time, uh, maybe in the future, this, this, uh, this doesn't exist anymore and the city is flooded or completely deserted due to, to the climate change. So, um, um, so I wanted to present this book, uh, Co-Emerging Economies, that we, um, that uh, Balton Laboratories, um, together with Rian Brands uh, from Philips and Godelief Spaas from Avance published uh, recently. And it was part of an artistic trajectory uh, inspired on the model Co-Emerging Futures by Rian Brands. Um, which uh, is based on an anthropocentric viewpoint and a post-anthropocentric viewpoint, the initial model. In the co-emerging economies, we try to explore uh, socio-economic perspectives on how to rethink our relationship with the planet and each other. So we, we chose two uh, narratives from the initial model, um, which are both anthropocentric views. Uh, in Gaia, we see ourselves as part of nature. In this view, we put the health of ecosystems first, rather than that of humans. In Eteria, we strive to become part of a post-human, post-biological intelligence, detaching ourselves from nature and the need for bio biological systems. Yeah, so in this, in, this, uh, in this project, the notion of networks also played a very important role in envisioning these new scenarios. Uh, for example, many ideas were inspired on how trees and mycelium operate 
on the ground as an interconnected, distributed and resilient network. And within this notion, we discussed this uh, distribution and ownership in a demater dematerialized and materialized or disembodied or embodied world. Um, and also um, we, um, and we looked uh, uh, by looking at this and uh, networks in nature and technology, we imagined these different economic narratives uh, and envisioned the dynamic balance and connected interplay between all living beings and the geological ecosystem. Also, uh, as uh, this interaction as described by Bruno Latour, which was already uh, touched upon before, this is simply because we have to figure out how to exist with Gaia as a war against her is impossible to win. At the same time, the concept of the rhizome by Deleuze, Deleuze is an important inspiration, as he argued that the more difference exists between two concepts, the more likely it is that a truly new idea can em emerge. And this is also how we set up the workshop and the research trajectory. So, uh, in the research co-emerging co economies, we focused on the two post-anthropocentric narratives, uh, which were called Gaia and Etheria. And uh, this notion of the Anthropocene can also be seen as a, as a paradigm of thought, mainly in Western societies, as this is a mindset that shapes all human processes and domains. And it's a belief and feeling of supremacy of human beings over all other beings and systems. So it is rooted in the unfounded belief of human exceptionalism and that humans are the right rational and uses reason and can be educated, have a system of ethics, and that most animals are that only rely on instinct for survival. And this, mi this mindset has led to a pro production of knowledge that humans from nature robbed us of our empathy for natural systems and conditioned us to see any other life or planetary material in a utilitarian way or as resources to satisfy human, human needs. It's uh, derived from the Greek mytholo mythology, the goddess that personifies planet Earth. Um, and it's, this, it's, it's rooted in the Gaia hypothesis uh, by James Lovelock and Lynn Ma Margulis in uh, 1974. Um, and in the, it was published uh, in a book called Gaia and suggested that living organisms on the planet have a deep web of relationships and interactions with their surrounding uh, inorganic environment to form a synergetic and self-regulating system that created and maintains the climate and that make life on Earth possible a work which was initially uh, very much criticized, uh, but now uh, has, has, has been validated and also has become the basis for many thinkers and scientists working on solutions for the climate crisis. So um, I'm going to show a few slides which uh, are part of the book, as the book kind of shows a lot of uh, many different essays, illustrations, uh, quotes, and um, poems and stories by participants. So these are just a few uh, of the um, quotes that you'll find in the book, uh, which also tries to kind of uh, break through our um, um, own foundational beliefs and biases. And this was, uh, we held the workshop completely online uh, due to the corona crisis. Uh, however, it was still very successful. We managed to connect even the digital space. And the, this uh, was uh, developed during this workshop and uh, shows uh, some of the ideas and, and drawings. Also, we worked a lot with uh, these kind of um, uh, um, thoughts and how we could connect to each other and share our ideas in breakout sessions. The other uh, uh, narrative, Etheria, is the metaphor for a future pursuing an existence where human minds, uh, between brackets consciousness, will live on and evolve indefinitely without the need of a biological body or even planet Earth as a basis for existence. 
The idea of the mind as a separate entity is rooted in the body-mind duality uh, that we know by the Greek philosopher Plato and was later articulated by the French philosopher René Descartes in his famous statement, I think, therefore I am. In other words, my biological body is just a carrier. My mind is what I really am. So the Aetherians envisioned a progression of artificial intel intelligence where the digital format can capture the essence of the human brain and allow human minds to live forever. In the other, in the ether, in a, digi in a digital quantum computing for format without the need for biological resources. On top of the perceived benefit of mortality, it would offer the freedom to develop intelligence of a far higher, at a far higher rate than the biological format would allow, as described by Ray Kurzweil in, in his singularity theory. It would also offer the freedom of cosmic exploration that would not be possible without a fragile biological vessel as a carrier. This raises a number of questions. For example, how would the transmutation in how would into a different format compared uh, to the human experience of today? How would a society in Etheria function? Will it value and what will value, how will value be exchanged? What would be the basis of, for an economy in a dematerialized society? So these are some slides that uh, participant made uh, in the group of the Etheria and that we as such also published in the book. Um, so to conclude, um, I want to come back to the networks and um, um, briefly quote what Rian Brandt uh, um, refers to in, uh, in, the, in, in connection to the, to the network and um, to the co-emerging economies. So our own earth has accumulated 4.5 billion years of development and learning, which is disseminated in the global earth life work. Natural systems on Earth show an incredible diversity and have innovated many systems like photosynthesis, the very complex chemicals used by natural systems that are still exploited by our health systems, reverse osmosis systems developed by creatures that live in very high salinity, uh, even eels that have developed their own electrical biocapacitors. All of this is more advanced than we can do today and was developed million, millions of years ago. When we look for answers, our first and best resource should be the approaches and systems used in natural networks. These systems developed and deployed advanced technology and create zero bio in compatible waste. It fosters healthy ecosystem and contributes to a planet that sustains life. The economy of nature, uh, is indistinguish indistinguishable from the ecology and is built on the relationships that exist in ecosystems. So um, here, uh, this is how the book looks like, um, and uh, it can online. And uh, this was um, um, my talk about uh, the co-emerging economies. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Olga. So uh, different perspectives. Um, uh, Daniel is saying here, I definitely need to read that. <laughs> so, um, so let's see if, if we have first, if you have any comments or, 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 or questions between yourself. So I don't know if, if you want to, to, to ask if you have any questions or any thing that you want to add to some of the things that were said today not also i'll start uh first yeah. of all i thank okay. you both uh olga okay. and, and rasa for for presenting you know there, there there's so much in common with the three of our presentations although we're going through this in, in, in different perspectives and I, but I think there's this there's this important understanding of like of, of where I think a lot of artists that I that I in my world of artists I work with for the most part are are, are really looking at at the understanding of, of uh, interspecies communication and also um, uh, around that the post um, anthropocene or in um, some people are calling this now the, the planthropocene uh, but really being able to have that empathy and I think Part of the my my um, 
my concern sometimes when I see a lot of um, bio art or, or work that's around um, uh, uh, other species is, is this, this uh, natural inclination to anthropomorphize the species that, you know, whether that be bacteria, I, I, I've been, you can, as you might see behind me, I'm doing, you know, this is DNA, but I've been doing a lot of work in bacteria and DNA and stuff, but really taking that same mindset of like, it, let's apply what we know as humans to the, this other uh, um, system, this other um, uh, species, and then we can understand it. But that's really, really, we're losing out so much from doing that. We're really like missing the entire point by, by looking at a species as a, in the same way that we look at each other. I mean, we are, we're, we are technically animals, but we really um, are, 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 lo are losing in this battle. And I think, you know, the, those who work in biomimicry are looking at this a little bit, but they're still trying to apply it back to humans. But, you know, really taking the approach that I think a lot of people who look at space ac exploration do is don't ask questions that are terrestrial um, to the planet, you know, that because this is what we understand, you need a, it, a lot of it is really changing the way that we even perceive it or the questions that we ask. And, and trying to create that empathy, and, and as you mentioned, um, but it's it's not easy because it is something that is it's still really foreign to us. And because we have um, so much Western, not, or, you know, the Western culture, we we really distanced ourselves from other species. I think that's not the case in in in, in, in other cultures and other um, around the world where they really see themselves as 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 you know uh, cohesive or or uh, connected back to the back to the planet but i think that it's really hard for for um just the the public or or really in you know with what with western studies to to be able to apply that particular mindset but it's it's, it's pretty critical because it's not it's not that um the just us as humans were have been affected by by the all the crises that are happening around the world it's the fact that we we're, we're ignoring the fact that you know, the, the fires basically killed habitats and, or, you know, these, the tsunamis, the, the toxicity, we, the sound pollution are, are killing other species. And those species have their own uh, purpose and criticality and understanding of each other and, and, and are able to connect with each other in different ways we will ever really be able to do. I mean, right now what we're doing is we're spying on them for the most part. You know, we put little sensors everywhere and, and, and look at data and say, oh, you know, they sound like this, they smell like this, they look like this. Um, but, but it's still, when it comes down to it, we're just, you know, spies, you know. I mean, what you're saying resonates uh, very much. Uh, a few things come to mind. Uh, the, uh, the first thing I maybe want to say is like uh, the book I, I, I presented, uh, you know, like in a way it's it's impossible, you know, like how can it was and it was also really hard to kind of thinking about post anthropocentric economies. Mm, what does that mean? Uh, of course, we have some idea, uh, but still, uh, what does that really entail? Uh, how it's, it's, it's actually not possible because we are human, right? So how can we think kind of in the post? Okay, we kind of we, we kind of coined it in a way that this uh, it's not about uh, the human values and the human needs, which is at the first at the front, but it's about uh, um, the ecosystem's uh, uh, values that we should look at. So, but this is also, we will have, you know, what is that, you know? So it's kind of like an attempt to do that, but still within our own uh, human uh, bias, uh, of course. Uh, especially in the book, uh, the Eteria was very hard because it was like we, we, we had to envision ourselves not in a disembodied way, you know, by like being in a network, being uh, kind of uh, maybe what is being con what is consciousness even, or what is it to be uh, a, um, and kind of like a, a, a digital entity? Um, what does that mean? And you know, what is ownership in that respect? How do I communicate? So these were all part of the the the, the, the brainstorm session that we had. It was very interesting, but it was also quite impossible. So the other thing I wanted to say was one one of this uh, quote which is in oh you can't see it because <laughs> okay i will read it out um so it says like there are other forms of intelligence such as as that of an octopus or a slime mold that responds to events in its environment we think of hierarchies between species with power structures based on human intelligence 
which puts life above all else. So, you know, like, yeah, I, this is also like, which resonates very much, you know, like how we are so tend to think about true, to, to think even, you know, instead of maybe sensing. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting um, because part of the idea of, of, I mean, the Balance and Balance Conference or these meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Usually in the Balance and Balance Conference, we bring people, as, as Daniel was saying before, from very different backgrounds and perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. Interested in the same topic, different perspectives. But when, but because we are doing things differently now, so this year with these sessions, I was thinking, okay, to change some of the rules, uh, some of the rules that are we're working, but then at the same time, for example, the first session we were bringing people together, like was an astrophysicist, an artist, and an artist with a scientific background, but all of them from the same country. In that case, was Brazil. So, so let's see, like try different combinations, and in fact, for example, trying to to inviting you to come. Here, networks but from different places different perspectives Olga and Rasa were meeting and doing projects together before but not with Daniel so part of the idea is also to help to generate this network so recently we were having a, a session uh, called an inward look so it was a lot about food alimentation uh, food security how we feed etc etc a part of the 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 idea was also because these people were not connected before and we can help to generate some kind of synergies so that people can be uh, with close interest. Like in this case, you're, I mean, you're, for example, Olga talking about economy, but economy different perspective. When we did the Balance and Balance 2018 in Rotterdam, uh, the, the topic overall theme was new value systems a new value system had to do with economy on one side and also with values i mean ethical values etc so, so it was a little bit ambiguous with all intention but that's part of the the idea and um, i was and and about uh, what daniel was saying on interspecies for example uh, I remember like usually when I'm showing examples of some of the people that were coming to Balance and Balance conferences before, I used to mention, for example, how you know many things are happening between presentations. It's not only about who is presenting and what you are presenting, but also when you go for taking food together and you start to talk about projects. So for example, bringing together Pablo Suarez from our Andrew Kruchkiewicz from the Red Cross Climate Center and with Roger Malina, or with Luis Saran. Luis Saran is a um, conductor. It's, it's a very well-known conductor uh, in Paraguay, but he's doing an amazing social work around environmental education in Paraguay. And his ideas and his project has been transforming part of the social reality in Paraguay, also being taken as a model in other places. And also uh, David Rowe, Rothenberg, for example, that was participating in different ways multiple times. Uh, and he's a philosopher, he's a musician, but he works on interspecies. And because he's a philosopher, it's not just what he's doing as a musician, but he can support through books uh, and, and in many different ways what he's proposing. And I think that's really an interesting approach because we are crossing links because we are finally we are searching. In some way, something I would like to, to, to ask is like we are like crossing links in different ways. We are trying to build different networks. Uh, I was trying to, to create a network called ECO, and we, did, we were discussing this in globalization, uh, different things that we were talking with Roger Marina and Leonardo too about how to visualize certain kind of things. Uh, my, Maybe my question is, OK, we are creating these different networks. Uh, someone told me once when I was trying to explain trying to do with the eco project that was a network too. Uh, well, OK, but finally, this is going to be like Google. You're going to have everything there. And of course, if you're going to have something like that, you that's not the idea, because then you have Google or other search engines. So 
how you see maybe these ideas of generating networks and knowledge networks, how you how we can make this really, uh, I know it's, it is maybe the question, but how we can make it more useful because we can find information, we can create a lot of things, but still um, we are creating a vision of a certain aspect, but suppose that you want to connect uh, a little bit like the Leo sphere, for example, you want to interconnect artists with scientists, with funding agencies, etc. What else can we do? What else can we yeah, do? I, I, because we are doing a lot. Yeah. So, Ricardo, the, the, you know, that's a good question about the, the the knowledge sharing networks. I'm a big proponent of uh, consortiums and 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 pulling together uh, resources all together from around the world, rather than trying to do things in you know one location or one university or one organization. Um, I you know I um, I think that the you know, everybody on here, I think with, you know, with the work that's going on at Riga and, and, and the Balton Labs, like very cool contemporary pieces can play. And uh, I think you have that ability, for example, to, to rapidly create things versus you have universities, you know, uh, uh, Felipe and Ricardo, you know, that are big beasts that you need to, to, to move like the, the beasts in very slow ways. Uh, to get them to, to move in, but you need that connection uh, between the artists, um, the more agile uh, organizations, and then also those who are working independently uh, and, and, and in industry as well. I mean, it needs to be all connected. Um, but one of the things that, that um, I was, uh, last year I was also a, an artist in residence at the Genome Institute uh, in, 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 of UC Santa Cruz, and they founded the genome browser, but they did this in a way that, that they work with, um, it's, it's an open source model and they work with um, uh, areas all over the world to basically bring in um, uh, genomic mapping and are able to like map out the, the genome of the, of, of the coronavirus. And the, the, the method on the scientific level to try to do these projects like this is, is, is not looking at like, okay, well, we have this funding here and we're going to hold on to it and we're going to make it in this box and then people will come to us. They're like, it, it is really around looking at how do you actually share all this information and then so all these different groups can work on analyzing it and convene and discuss that, discuss the questions, discuss the findings. And, you know, the, the, the peer review process of everything needs to get revised and revisited and reimagined. But it's also important to be able to um, read and listen and hear and understand those knowledge networks amongst each other and be able to break out of, um, uh, of it being very um, uh, Western focused or English focused, being able to, to do things in, in, with, with multilingualism, um, which is really critical. And there are some good tools that are being built out there to make that happen. I mean, now like I can go to, uh, um, uh, you know, websites and some, they'll, they'll, they'll be, there'll be certain things that are translated into different languages and, and, and have so being able to have that particular context, but it really is about like us sort of removing our egos, our um, understanding of like where that funding is coming from. Cause I think everything, everything comes down to money, right? Who's going to pay for this? <laughs> um, but really thinking about this as like, okay, we have this long-term goal. Let's just say we have this long-term goal of, of really being able to, to create a rapid response system, as I was sharing, um, that looked at um, uh, groundswell or community um, conversations so that we can respond to uh, um, um, water scarcity, um, that we can respond to nuclear um, uh, energy um, disasters or catastrophes, um, that we have that. And that it's not that we're doing something in a short period of time, right? So we have like, we're not looking at something in a one year time frame. We're looking at something in a 10 year time frame. So we start to start to think in these long 10, 20, 100 year time frames, and then start to bring in those networks um, that need to be able to turn this. And everybody's understanding that we're going to be able to contribute collaboratively and connect collaboratively and also reward and acknowledge those who have contributed. Okay. I think that's also really critical is that like, if we do this together, we also need to acknowledge each other very well together. And I think that's really, really important because nobody does things in a vacuum or by themselves um, and, and it can't get done alone. But it's it's like, you know, how do we actually then make a big 
push together and share that same space. And I think, I think that's challenging um, because there's still politics involved in it in territories. And then like the issue of like having too, you know, too many, you know, white tech, <laughs> white tech boys, you know, build <laughs> systems. We got to like break that thing, that knowledge, uh, that apart and being able to build things from the crap from, from um, a really inclusive an equitable environment, but it can be done. It's not impossible. Um, we're doing it now. We're in this call together, starting it. But you know, like you know, Felipe and Ricardo. I know both of you are are at different institutions. You can start that, and then you know, Rasa and Olga. I mean, I know that you are proximately a lot closer together than I am. But you know, it can get done. It's it's definitely possible. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if Felipe, you have any questions or comments or. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. I would like to say a few words, but in Spanish. <laughs> Ricardo, okay. please translate. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, no, no. I, eh, escuchando, eh, me parecía muy muy interesante la la eh, digamos eh, los que surgen a partir de estos diálogos, ¿no? Y, y, y pensaba mucho de los procesos y proyectos que llevamos a cabo en Colombia. Eh, precisamente, pues, están buscando generar esas interconexiones. Ricardo es testigo, ¿no? Eh, Daniel también, de, de procesos que aquí en Colombia eh, implementamos, llevamos a cabo, como por ejemplo, ¿no? El Festival Internacional de la Imagen, ¿no? Que, que ha posibilitado establecer diálogos e interconexiones. Y, y salir de la, de, de la universidad, salir de la academia, ¿no? Para, para eh, interconectar otros saberes, por ejemplo, lo ancestral, ¿no? Nuestras comunidades indígenas, ¿no? Que por muchos siglos hemos ignorado, ¿no? Entonces hay un saber eh, a la que nos eh, invita, digamos, esta, estos, estos espacios como esta cátedra en arte y clima, ¿no? Donde ustedes están participando y han participado muchos otros invitados. ¿no? donde lo, 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 lo que observamos es como procesos de interconexión, como buscando generar dinámicas comunes que nos posibiliten enfrentar o, digamos, eh, desarrollar proyectos y procesos que nos posibiliten enfrentar esos retos complejos de la, de la, de, 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 de la globalidad, del cambio climático, etc. ¿no? Entonces, me parece que, 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 digamos, que estos espacios nos han inspirado esto, estos diálogos permanentes que hemos tenido con muchos de los artistas teóricos que han participado eh, tanto en la cátedra, en Arte y Clima, como en el, la otra cátedra que, ten, que tenemos de diseño, arte y ciencia. Y es como ese deseo de, de abrir, de, de interconectarnos, ¿no? de, de intentar construir un pensamiento común más allá de las fronteras de la, de la universidad. ¿no? Eh, este año, precisamente, ya lo mencionaba al inicio, eh, surge el doctorado en diseño, arte y ciencia, inspirado precisamente en estos espacios de diálogo, ¿no? con la absoluta certeza de que es a través de la red, que es a través del de compartir conocimientos, como podemos eh, entender nuestro rol eh, académico, nuestro rol como, como investigadores, como artistas, como creadores. En un, en un momento complejo como el que vivimos, ¿no? Entonces, uh, nada, es simplemente eh, manifestar que, 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 claro, que estos espacios de trabajo, estos espacios de red, de interconexión, nos invitan, al menos desde Colombia, ¿no? A continuar desarrollando muchos procesos, continuar con el festival, con proyectos nuevos como el de las cátedras, o con el festival que ya mencionaba, lo vamos a hacer en octubre, y en el que esperamos seguir reflexionando de esos otros conocimientos desde el sur, lo que hemos llamado las surtropías. Perdón, Ricardo, la extensión. <risa> me mi... me mal que anoté, ¿no? Porque si no... Ok, sorry, I was taking notes because was, uh, if not, was going to be impossible. But um, uh, Felipe César was, was emphasizing several things, like, for example, the, the very interesting dialogues have been held during this series. I mean, this is the eighth session of the series of this year, but uh, also um, 
underlining the, the, the processes and, and the projects that in Colombia have been happening during the past years. Like uh, uh, he said that um, Daniel and myself, we have been witnesses of different aspects of that. Like for example, the Image Fest, the International Image Festival that has been running. That was the way that I was coming to, to Colombia and that I met Felipe and I met uh, this place in the world like about 14 years ago, more or less. Yeah. So uh, and the Image Fest has been running for over 20 years, I have been bringing to Colombia many people from all over the world. And I'm adding this, not Felipe said this, but I mean, I'm adding that you you could find in this place uh, not only not only the same people that you are going to find in any other big festival around the world, but also you're going to find, you're going to meet, you're going to talk with people coming from many places in Latin America. So you're going to cross boundaries really in a very way. Coming back to what Felipe was saying, he was also uh, mentioning about the idea of going out from the university, what was said before, and to include different kinds of knowledges, like for example, uh, ancestors and ancestry knowledge that has been left aside for many years. Um, uh, the idea of the creation and generation of new projects, because the Image Festival is, is running and this year is going to be uh, held between Manizales and Bogota uh, in October. But there are other projects, like for example, this balance and balance chair in art and climate, but there is another chair that is called DAC, that is in design, art and science. And all these projects have been leading to a larger uh, scope and uh, perspective that is uh, the PhD in design, art and science that has been approved at the um, Jorge Tadeo Lozano University. Um, just, I think that was like a, a week ago or 10 days ago that was approved. So this is really something very new. And the idea is, yes, to, to be in the university, but go beyond the university. Because as Felipe said, we, these are complex times, very complex times. And uh, this possibility of working in the university, but going beyond the university, I think is substantially, it's, it's really important. And uh, the topic of, uh, let me mention to close, uh, the topic of this um, image festival to be held in October is, uh, in Spanish, in Spanish is uh, surtropias is something like south tropy, like okay, it's south tropy. So uh, of course it's going to receive people from all over the world as usual, but I mean the focus is a little bit more in the south, yeah. Uh, and I think with a different perspective and a different vision, I think that's really uh, important. But the difference is that. You know, I have been participating in many, many, many editions of the festival. And, and the idea is, in this case, even if it's South Ropi, the topic is not going that to, to be only focused on that. And the people coming are not going to come only for, from, from the South. Well, on the contrary, it is very interesting to receive people coming from different places and talking about uh, the South, too. So I think that's... Uh, really interesting point, a um, um, very interesting perspective. So um, Ricardo, at the uh, same time, so the mix will be, <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 because South, uh, no in contrast of North, no, 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 is more, is more South in concept of the moving around, no, como, como, it's a dynamic word, dynamic word, but uh, me, uh, the meaning is more, moving moving around of center of the uh, 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 yes it's more no no the concept no 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 is related with the 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 opposite of the north it's more the moving yes the, yeah. the dynamic, moving dynamic. And and pro yes dynamic integrative maybe yes more, it's, it's more, than, more in, in this sense no yes that uh, like we said that like many people said before, like the South also exists, right? Uh, yes. So, yes, I mean, <laughs> the, this idea of integration and moving uh, is maybe a, a little bit of a different perspective. Yes, it's possible. Maybe if we have a little bit of, of time, uh, I would like to, 
tu, tu ask. No sé si querías decir algo más, Felipe, si no. No, no. Oh, I'm going to ask Rasa something. Ok. Uh, uh, Rasa, talking about all, all these things and networks, I, you show something at the very beginning in your presentation, but for me, when I knew about this project, it was very inspiring. This was many years ago about the Baltic um, area, Baltic region, and all this this map that you were creating. Uh, I would love if you could talk a little bit about that and how it was created. It was already like a good number of years ago, so probably was not as, I mean, it was more difficult than if you need to do it today. So if you can share something about the idea, how this started and the results too, I would love that. Uh -huh. Okay, so you mean this map, uh, which was, which one, <laughs> was this internet radio networks or? Yes, you, you were showing it, uh, you were showing, yes, when you were just at the very beginning, uh, I remember that you were doing this with, uh, between different Baltic countries, and you were having like um, these connecting dots between the places where you could find uh, uh, being uh, generating energy in different ways, or like a different aspects relating art and science and for example mm -hmm. energy and food etc waste oh, yeah yeah so the so i did my phd actually about the uh, network communities uh, especially of the creative ones in the uh, in the 90s so this was the first time when i did these mappings of 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 the active people from the 90s um, especially of the, our own network, which was uh, quite quite global, actually connecting about 60 different nodes all over the world, uh, but really like very, very diverse. So that was also my, my, my interest to map this diversity so that people can, uh, it can be a 20, 24 seven uh, small FM radio, or it can be a club radio, it can be independent artist initiative, which is just putting some microphone outside of the window, but anything which was to do with the sound was creating this network. So it was the back then in the nineties when uh, the making connections just, just as a pure act was much more imp important than the content which we were producing because content was not interested. We were not interested in an audience was zero. So there were more people participating than listening. So that was the first early stage network. So then the other one, so which was that you, I think, yeah, quite, quite already uh, profound, profound. We did a bit later. So starting with the, uh, this financial crisis of 2008, when, when Latvia was hit quite heavily as well, actually at, at the moment as well. So everybody complains about, um, <laughs> different uh, yeah yeah so so crisis but the prices in Latvia definitely have doubled than in your countries already so speeding up so uh, but uh, but but yeah but we were also thinking so what to do so uh, about this um, our interest in sustainability in these techno ecological networks so we again we started to to, to map initiatives and also physically actually to move we, we, we went back like to 90s uh, strategies uh, like of this post-Soviet countries. We went back uh, again uh, to physically, we were, uh, we were traveling to different Nordic countries, studying cases of renewable energy, of smart buildings, of offshore winds. So we went to Samso Island, which is a, such a unique case in Denmark. Uh, so we visited Interactive Institute in Stockholm. And so we've learned so much uh, and we started to map trying just to a little bit uh, yeah, to create some kind of a new taxonomy. What are all these different directions uh, which could lead into this more sustainable way of living? So there were uh, like uh, all types of them. One, one was, uh, uh, and by my surprise, there were not so much actually about the energy. So we were ones who were building these bacteria batteries, but mm. their much more interest was in uh, food. Their much more interest was in uh, uh, foraging cultures, yeah, in a, in a different, even exchanges of traditional receipts, how to make a jam. Is, we didn't know that actually this even can be very different, even from house to house, even from Finland to Estonia. So how, what people do with berries, for example, what they collect in the forest. 
uh, and so on. Yeah, herbal teas, yeah. moonshine. How to make? How it was in the Soviet times when the uh, mothers made uh, for uh, for the for their soldiers and sent to to Russian army also the moonshine in a very simple methods like very simple distillation. So and all type of all this kind of a mix between receipts with, between the. Uh, also, innovative technologies: how to make this uh, dye sens sensitized solar cell an edible solar cell. So it, this was all came together in the network, which we call the Renewable Futures Network. Uh, since about two thousand nine, we are still working in it. Good. So let's say it's very interesting. I remember when I found that uh, project at the very beginning. I mean, it was really really interesting for me. And was giving me very interesting ideas also so I'm, I'm really grateful that you did those kind of projects because I found it really great in fact I was like a I, I think a, like a pioneering work in that area and the mapping was um, really really interesting um, so uh, yes some comments from Daniel too so <laughs> about that uh, the, those great projects, I think it's really, really impressive what you were doing at that time. So I think that we are all doing um, the best we can. I don't know if you have any other, because I mean, what I was saying before is that, yes, the idea is to reach other people with what, with these kind of gatherings and, and meetings, so you can present different projects, but also uh, whatever you, you can bring together. For example, when I was telling you about the, this inward look meeting that we had recently, we we brought three people that finally they didn't know each other from from before. So finally, uh, most of them were really interested in, in doing projects together. So the idea is not only making connections you know outside, but also bringing people together that can be inspired or connected to do other things. So that's part of the idea, and and of course. Uh, I agree that we need to maybe systematize or find better ways to connect uh, peoples. And everyone is doing different attempts, like Daniel was showing the Leosphere and other projects. And we are, everyone is doing like uh, different attempts or creating these databases and networks. So we still need to go. I, I find it's, it's not enough. Of course, we are doing a lot, a lot, but I mean, we see that the efforts are short in terms of um, the environmental crisis uh, speed, let's put it that way. So um, I think that these kind of meetings is also good, not only for what you are doing and what was doing before and what you are planning to do, but also if you have any ideas that you think, okay, it would be great if maybe not us, but maybe someone else could be another group, another agency, could be a government, could be a philanthropist. But if you have any idea of, of, okay, these kind of actions could bring some other solutions or partial solutions, okay, I would be very welcome to, to hear any comments on that too. So I know it's very open, maybe it's too vague. We are a little bit, uh, we hear a lot of possible solutions or partial solutions but we find at the same time that uh, what you were saying before about it, everything is happening now 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 and solutions takes time and problems are going much faster than solutions usually i don't know if you have any any comments or or ideas for whoever it would be great to to share that mm -hmm. I, I, a, a few ideas come to mind. Um, uh, for, I don't know, like I think um, the examples here already show a lot of interesting interconnections. And I've known Raza for, uh, for many years and we've been working together. And I think that's a great example also of, uh, of a network and same for the balance unbalance. Um, so, uh, and, and, and now these two networks actually join here which is great. So I think actually it's happening. And of course, you can always want more, uh, but maybe we can also want maybe different, something not more, but something different. I don't know. I just 
you know, thinking out loud. And uh, I, I'm personally also thinking a lot about, you know, like how can you maybe create uh, networks between uh, something which is, you know, the global and maybe the very local, you know. So to to, to see like, okay, uh, it's it's uh, I know a lot of people all over the world who think alike, but maybe not so much close to my to 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 my own place, to my own hometown. And I think that's also important to kind of uh, relate to uh, um, um, connect to people close to you. We, who, who have different ideas as well, um, and 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 what can we learn from that? Uh, it also reminds me of a project we did, which was called Age of Wonderland, where we invited every year <coughs> uh, six people from the global south, uh, and they we invited them to come over to the Netherlands and to work with uh, the local community. So their projects would kind of be initiation for developing something, which would then also have uh, uh, an impact in their own communities, and we would learn from them. We would collaborate uh, and then this there there would be like something that would go back into their own communities so maybe that's also like playful ways how we can connect and interconnect and uh, i still connect with, with with many of these people so i think these are also very important to find meaningful connections which are lifetime connections and um and and that's you know, this is like one example. Another idea that popped up is maybe the, the concept of Lumbu, which is now in the Kassel Documenta in, in Germany. Um, so it's happening, uh, I don't know, opening somewhere in June. And uh, some, some people that I know from Indonesia, they are uh, working there on the concept of Lumbu, which is also a lot with the community and looking at the surplus of uh, uh of harvest and how can and that's the being distributed amongst uh, everyone so everyone uh, gains something and this is the a bit of roughly described the concept of lumbo and i know like in the gatherings you know they always try to kind of focus on what do we uh, what do we harvest and this is a very interesting way to look at uh, um, what what do we um, it could be could be an idea could just be uh, uh, um, I don't know whatever the, the connections that we make in this talk um, um, knowing some of you but not knowing others and maybe that's also a different perspective to look at the harvest of each thing that we do in networks maybe. Thank you. So um, we are reaching the end. I don't know if you have anything, mm -hmm. anything else. Rasa, Daniel, Olga, Felipe. If not, we are going to start closing this session. Um, just I want to thank Milena and I want to thank Andres that are on the back stage, uh, helping to make all this happen in the university has been a big support during all these sessions really the session we had were very different one from each other people like from advisors from the un in risk management astrophysicists artists scientists of many different perspectives um yes we are all doing the best we can there's a lot of things to do um and uh, yes even if if this is called the balance on balance chair in art and climate, we include other topics because the relations are, are strong between many things. So I was mentioning just now about the food and, and food security. And also today we have been talking not only about networks, but also about a little bit about the economy. So these different perspectives that are linked in one way or the other to the central topic that has to do the environmental crisis and the many crises that we are going through now so as i said at the beginning um, this was session number eight from the cathedra balance and balance and arte y clima the support has been mainly uh, from the jorge tadeo lozano university and also we had support from the maloca science center in bogota Colombia uh, Concordia University in Canada, and Sayarte Untred in Argentina, and the network of people. I'm very grateful for all the people who have been participating in the network of people 
linked to the balance and balance uh, presentations. So I don't know if I would like Felipe if you want to close this with a few words. And I would ask you once uh, we receive the message that the streaming is uh, ending, just to stay for a couple of minutes after we say bye. So uh, just to make our final evaluation. But for me, these eight sessions, I'm very happy we were able to have these eight sessions because we're really great. And we are keeping this uh, in videos that are going to stay on YouTube and Facebook. So uh, people will be able to consult this after. And I hope and that this will be helpful for initiate other projects too. And maybe different projects like we were saying just now not only more, larger, etc., but maybe different approaches so we can explore different possibilities and different solutions to the problem. Thank you so much to everyone. Felipe. Gracias, Ricardo. No, solo agradecerte de nuevo eh, y, a, y, a, y a todos por, por, y a todas por la participación. Eh, nada, invitarlos, eh, supongo yo, Ricardo, a una segunda cohorte de la, de la sesión de la cátedra Balance and Balance en Arte y Clima y, y bueno, a, a continuar vinculados y en red con nuestros programas y con las instituciones con las cuales desarrollamos programas y procesos. Muchas gracias a, a Judy Milena, a Andrés, a todo el equipo de la Tadeo que hacen posible la conexión y en línea eh, y la transmisión en línea de este, de este programa. Un, un abrazo especial y seguimos en contacto. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye, thank you.